From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Microsoft gets smacked by Tenable over Azure vulnerability, 75% of organizations set to ban generative AI, and Evil Proxy Phishing Kit targets the C-suite. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you on this week's Cybersecurity Headlines. And now we get a chance for some insight, opinion, and expertise on these stories and more from our guest, Mike Woods, the corporate CISO at GE. Mike, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure to have you on. Mike, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> it's good. Good. Thank you so much for making the time and being on the show. I know it's a busy time for you over at GE, so uh, uh, really, really appreciate making the time for the show. All Absolutely right. glad to be here. Before we move on, we also have to thank our sponsor, Conveyor. Pass your security questionnaires to their AI bot. Remember, you can join us on YouTube Live. Go to CISOseries.com, hit the events drop down, and look for the cybersecurity headlines week in review image. It's the third one down. Click on it to join us. And if you're already subscribed to the CISO series on YouTube, just be sure to turn on notifications and you'll know when we go live. We also love to see your comments in chat. So be sure you're getting in there, submitting stuff. We love to highlight that and see what you think of our discussion as we are going. And here we will get to them toward the end of the show in our new audience comment section. It's very exclusive. We can't wait. We've got about 20 minutes though, so let's jump right into the news. Microsoft resolves vulnerability following criticism from Tenable CEO. Microsoft has resolved a vulnerability that allows threat actors to gain access to information managed by Azure Active Directory, a story that has dominated the news cycle for weeks now. Amit Yorin, the CEO of the cybersecurity firm Tenable, published a scathing LinkedIn post bashing the tech giant for its handling of the vulnerability. Yorin cited delays and an incomplete fix that enabled Chinese espionage against the United States government and adds, Microsoft's lack of transparency applies to breaches, irresponsible security practices, and to vulnerabilities, all of which expose their customers to risks they are deliberately kept in the dark about. So, Mike, uh, Amit Yorin should not exactly expect to get a vendor of the month coffee mug from Redmond anytime soon. No, no, probably not. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so I would say this. Uh, Microsoft is... is often looked at as the target for threat actors just because the surface area and the utilization and in industry is just so wide and, and deep, right? But I, I, the way I think about it on this one is that Microsoft, when it comes to cloud, I guess they're about 20% market share. They're trying to catch Amazon 40%, 45% market share. Everyone else is way, way behind these guys. And in general, you can trust what Microsoft is doing, I think, right? You, you look at uh, Patch Tuesdays and the, the rigor that they've put around their security program. But I think this is more of a reputational piece for them. If they want to be able to continue to have confidence with their partners, they, they need to get into the sausage making a little bit more on this and open up the doors a little bit more on how are they dealing with um, – these types of situations, right? We, we, we should have a little bit more transparency, I think, from him, uh, from, from Microsoft. So I think that's what the, the Tenable CEO was, was trying to get after. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if it spurs some change and, uh, you know, maybe Brad Smith could uh, give him a hug or something like that at some point and, uh, and patch things over. But uh, it, it's unusual to see you know, from a company like Tenable coming so strongly uh, yeah. against Microsoft, to your point. And I think it is about finding that right balance of, hey, we want to be the the strong, silent type that Microsoft has kind of been used to, to, uh, you know, uh, and we've we've definitely seen some some more transparency in terms of logging on like free tiers and stuff like that for a lot of their services. So uh, we will see if that's a continued trend going forward. Our next story here, 75 percent of organizations set to ban generative AI or are they? According to results of a global survey released by BlackBerry on Tuesday, 75% of organizations worldwide are currently implementing or considering bans on chat GPT and other generative AI applications. Many point to risks of data security, privacy, and corporate reputation as driving their decisions. Despite their inclination toward outright bans, the majority also recognize the opportunity for generative AI apps to increase efficiency and innovation, enhance creativity, and assist in cyber defense, something we've definitely talked about across the CISO series shows now already and probably will continue to beat the drum on. 
Mike, though, this reminds me, you know, maybe last month over the last year when the exact same words were used to discuss remote work. I'm curious, what do you make of the survey's numbers? Yeah, no, this is a this is a good point, and I, I really the side of these organizations that 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 were in that survey to ban this. Like, look, when it comes to innovation in my organization, I I, I want I don't like bans. I, I I want boundaries, right? I want to be able to control. I want to be able to monitor what's going on, but I can't get in the way of this type of innovation. And in fact, people will work around you anyway. Um, so I don't think bans are the solution here. I think having monitoring, um, having uh, the proper level of control to understand where your data is going is true anyway uh, as a cyber risk professional. So uh, bans uh, not on board with that. To the second point of that, that article where it mentioned of, hey, getting cybersecurity people to dig in on this, I think we have to. Um, certainly, if you if you looked at what's going on in the industry, if you just look at the GPT piece as a as a as a component there, the worm GPT and poison GPT and fraud GPT, these things are coming. They're already out there. Um, they they're using um, uh, LLM solutions for uh, expedited phishing attacks, right? So it, it's it's really something that uh, you need your teams working on. So. In my opinion, don't ban it, um, but but have some boundaries with it for sure. Good awareness, uh, good monitoring, good controls, that sort of thing. I, I do have some sympathy for organizations because I, I, I think of this in terms of like a, a shift in terms of like BYOD, right? Where it, it, it feels almost anathema to a lot of security practices except that had like massive barriers to entry, right? In terms of price and, and, and in terms of adoption and that kind of stuff. Whereas ChatGPT is literally like, I signed up for an account, I can use this immediately and I can see the efficiencies of this immediately. And so, but to your point, yeah, like let's let's embrace this. Let's, let's put the right tooling around it. I think part of this also is that as these tools become less general purpose and almost tech demos in the case of chat GPT, as we start getting more industry specific verticals, I think it becomes much easier to have that, you know, controls and, and boundary kind of conversation versus kind of a, a, a catch all like we have with chat GPT or Google Bard. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think that, that's exactly right. So uh, it's an evolving situation and I think it's one that, that organizations are going to have to pay attention to and deal with as it, as it goes. Right. Um, for sure. Our next story here, attackers use evil proxy phishing kit to take over executives, Microsoft 365 accounts. I guess, you know, for a phishing kit, it did what it said in the tin. Proofpoint, which released a report on the incidents on Wednesday, said the attacks exhibited both the prevalence of prepackaged phishing as a service toolkits. In all, Proofpoint observed the targeting of more than 100 organizations with evil proxy, with 35% of the compromised accounts being MFA enabled. More than one third of the accounts belong to C-level executives, including CEOs and chief financial officers. Mike, there's at least two elephants in the room for this. One, the fact that more than a third of the accounts had MFA enabled. And second, that the C-suite is the target. Does the MFA thing bother you? And are C-suite officers, I guess, maybe a softer target than even regular employees? Yeah, so I, I think there's a couple of pieces here, right, that we, we need to dig into. So when I think about uh, MFA for a lot of folks that aren't maybe technical, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, solutions, you, you swipe or you press a button for your MFA, and, and there are compromises around that, that that threat actors are taking advantage of, right, that, that swipe fatigue. So I think that might have something to do with some of these. But the other one is just those, those those whaling or spear phishing attacks going after those those targets, they're creating a of what is, or they're trying to create a profile of what's normative activity for that uh, executive, right? Based on all the social engineering they can do, and then they're going to try to inject at the right moment for you know, hey, a, a fraudulent wire transfer or what have you. So I think it's a little bit of a combination, probably, but. I think having good, strong MFA, making sure your your senior leadership understands how to use that, um, making sure it's, it's implemented across your estate of applications, especially those critical ones uh, where, where money is. Plus, it, if your organization is doing a lot of those transactions and it needs an executive approval, you know, four eyes type of approaches where you, you literally have a, a physical control of a person looking at a transaction is also you know, important as you bleed in 
you know, cyber bleeds into this, this, this fraud industry quite a bit, right? And you know, we deal with that all the time of, in terms of trying to prevent those types of things happening in our organization. All right, our next story here, Zoom's user policies are having a week. Zoom, the favorite social media platform of house cats everywhere, updated its terms of service last month to include the right to use some customer service-generated data for training and optimizing its various machine learning models. Zoom said that training on voice, video, or chat data would be done on users that turn on trials of AI tools with a transparent consent process, although it didn't kind of go into specifics what that would look like. The background in this story was blurred somewhat with the company saying today that it will not use audio, video, or chat customer content to train our artificial intelligence models without your consent. Although, again, there are Again, no specifics on how that consent is going to be obtained. This is according to an article in The Verge. So, Mike, this is certainly not an unexpected development, but from a clarity standpoint, they seem to still kind of be on mute. Zoom basically kept the tradition of meetings alive during the pandemic. Hey, thanks, Zoom, for that. And continues to do so, along with, of course, we have Teams, Google Meet, a, a bevy of others, BlueJeans, RIP. Most of us do not give much thoughts to the machinery that, our words and faces pass through when we work. I'm curious, though, given the conversation that this engendered with this TOS, what's your take on this? Yeah, no, uh, I, 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 I'm glad they clarified it. But certainly, you know, it, whenever we're dealing with uh, a, a situation like Zoom or any of these other platforms that are providing you a free service, and it's just the old adage of if, if you're not paying for it, you're probably the product, right? And, 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 it, and this is no different in this case, right? We had some cases of translation tools in the past that had a very similar uh, uh, user agreement where basically your data was theirs and they were, they were doing uh, enhancements of their software and improving their product based on your inputs and your, your feedback, right? And so without an enterprise license or, or an end user agreement that uh, is going to be in line with what your organization is comfortable with, right? Um, you're gonna you're gonna potentially want to want to prevent that or or get to the point of funding um, uh, the licensing to to get more control over what happens with that data. All right. Well, before we move on, we want to spend a few moments and thank our sponsor for today, Conveyor. We can all agree that there's one thing the AI bots can take from us: completing customer security questionnaires. That's why Conveyor built a GPT questionnaire response tool. It auto-generates precise, accurate answers to entire questionnaires with accuracy far superior to existing tools on the market. It's so accurate, your customers can now use it in their new Upload Questions to Trust Portal feature. It's exactly as it sounds. Customers can upload questions, and the AI will generate instant answers based on your Trust Portal content. Try a free proof of concept with your own data and see why top SaaS companies are making the switch from outdated RFP software and other portal solutions. Learn more at conveyor.com. Banks hit with fines for using out-of-band chat apps. On Tuesday, U.S. regulators announced a combined four, $549 million in penalties against Wells Fargo and a raft of smaller or non-U.S. firms that failed to maintain electronic records of employee communications. The firms admitted using side channels, things like WhatsApp, to discuss company business dating as far back as 2019, and that violates federal security laws for failing to preserve records. These actions allow similar settlements totaling more than $2 billion with bigger players, including J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley and Citigroup, a.k.a. the U.S. financial sector. So, Mike, considering the speed with which these banks apply for NSF charge with something on a return check, it seems somewhat disappointing that they will violate federal security laws so willingly. One could argue this falls under the same umbrella as using Zoom for meetings. But aren't federal security laws something that these banks should, you know, really know better about? Yeah, it certainly does, right? Like, so you know, WhatsApp is a is a is a good example, right? Uh, it, it, in our organization, it's not allowed for uh, non. Uh, for, it's only allowed for non business purposes, right? And certain data cannot be uh, used utilized within the tool, right? So when it comes to a, a bank who's who's actually got a regulatory constraint on there to, to keep records, right, uh, in, in an appropriate fashion. It seems very odd to me that they would, would be able to um, 
deal with um, uh, or, or to take the, the leap of not uh, following that regulation, right? And to your point on, on the speed and, and nimbleness they, they are of, of, of handling consumer relations when it comes to charges and fees, you would think that they would uh, uh, address this, and I believe they will, right? Um, I, I think this will hopefully be a, an industry opener in terms of uh, folks going to their, their cyber and compliance teams and fixing this within the industry. So. All right, well, the next story here, new downfall CPU attacks steal sensitive data. Downfall is a vulnerability that affects multiple Intel microprocessor families and allows the theft of cryptographic keys and other sensitive information protected by Intel's hardware-based memory encryption mechanism called Software Guard X or SGX. You've probably seen it abbreviated. So this is a much larger story, Mike, but to qualify, this vulnerability has been patched by Intel and was a proof of concept that would be admittedly difficult to deploy in the real world, though, although not impossible. And that speaks to those vulnerabilities in cybersecurity, the ones that seem too obscure or expensive to fix, especially when CISOs have more pressing matters to attend to. I'm curious, you know, we all know the, the risk equals uh, impact versus, you know, times frequency. But what value do such proof of concept discoveries offer to you on something like this? Well, it's just it's just uh, to the product, right, into what's going on in, in the industry in terms of finding flaws and vulnerabilities uh, like this one reminds me a lot of, I believe it was Meltdown uh, more recently. Uh, and so it, it, yeah. it, these things are, are very hard to exploit if you're not in a lab environment with, with physical access. These are not remotely exploitable things so far, but you can bet, you can bet the bad guys are looking on how can I do, how can I take advantage of this with, with a remote executable, right? Like how could I go beyond what the proof of concept was? So that, that's what helps to us. I mean, you know, it was patched. So I think that's good. So, um, but but the, we're seeing more of these these firmware, hardware, Intel chip type, uh, um, or so it's a chip type uh, vulnerabilities out there. And it, it, it is a bit concerning. But uh, the good thing is, is the the vendors are are on it, right? I mean, in many cases, they're the ones finding these problems and fixing them on their own. So that that's a good thing. Yeah, it does seem, I believe it was a Google security researcher that found this, but like, that's the way it's supposed to work, right? They waited a year to disclose yeah. this. Uh, they were working with Intel, you know, like this is the security apparatus working as desired. I am curious real quick though, given what we've seen since the invasion of Ukraine, right? With like really focused nation state kind of level attacks, uh, you know, APTs are nothing new, obviously, but like the, the idea of these exploits being out there for, for, threat actors that that need to breach one organization right they're not just going for lowest hanging fruit does is this any more of a concern or are those actors already having extremely sophisticated toolkits that that probably have so I, I think a lot of them for the longer term plays are going to probably look at it i mean think about it i mean some of these organizations and state sponsored they, they've got people they've got feet on the ground right they've got people that potentially could have access to your hardware right um mm -hmm. so uh yeah i mean i think for certain organizations that have a large footprint um, and and have uh, already been targeted because many of these organizations know who they've been targeted by, right? Based on um, uh, their vendors and, and based on their interaction with law enforcement for prior uh, incidents, they know if they're being targeted and by whom. And so, for those organizations, I would I would also look deeper into, hey, you know, if it takes a physical um, access for something, it, it goes into more of this. Uh, traditional espionage and cyber starting to merge, in my opinion, for some to, to take advantage of a threat like this one, right? All right. And our last story today, Tampa General Hospital sued over data breach. A law firm has lodged a class action lawsuit against Tampa General Hospital on behalf of three victims impacted by a data breach that occurred in May and which resulted in the theft of PII and HIPAA data belonging to approximately 1.2 million patients. The plaintiffs contend that the Tampa General Hospital not only failed to secure the personal and medical data adequately, but also exacerbated the situation by delaying the notification of victims until July 19th. That's over two months after the initial breach. So, Mike, do you see this as becoming the inevitable next wave in cybercrime? You know, the threat of litigation uh, as victims uh, are suing companies uh, who themselves are victimized. I mean, how might this play out long term? Does this signal anything to you? 
Yeah, no, this is this is this is what's coming for litigation. Believe me, like, I, from what I from what I read with this article, um, I don't know how much steam this one's picked up, but I think it's something that certainly law firms are going to pick up on. They're going to be like, wait a minute, we can we can sue if 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 someone did not provide good um, proper cyber uh, controls and, and compliance controls that they needed to do that they committed to to do. Um, and, and do it on a on a, a class action action scale, uh, and certainly, uh, unfortunately, healthcare is going to be a target from from those lawsuits, right? Because they've got HIPAA, they've got all of these uh, PHI related uh, uh, regulations involved, and it's in sort of an easy target, I think, right? To say, look, you you have to follow these rules, and you didn't, and you didn't put things in place that you should have, and. Um, your customers and the stage patients were impacted, right? Uh, yeah, I'll be interested to see if this sets a precedent for is it the the scale of the breach or is it like any kind of perceived alleged negligence in that way, or is it the delay in notification? Because I think if it's the latter, that is a seemingly a more fixable problem, right? As opposed to you know the the reality that we live in an age of of. Just yeah, I mean, I don't think data I, personally. I don't think it's the delay in in, in response there because I mean, for for a, a, a health organization to provide, I mean, I looked at the dates. I mean, it didn't seem out of the realm of of you know for a material breach, right? Which it feels like this yeah. was. It, it doesn't seem that far outside. Now, if it's a if it's a uh, a publicly traded company, you know, we have these. Uh, SEG, uh, ESG rules now, which are, are very uh, uh, restrictive in terms of how fast you have to respond for a material breach. And so if they were publicly traded, they would probably also be getting calls from the SEC. Um, so uh, I think it's a play later on, particularly for public companies. But I think in this particular case, it's more of the negligence play. I think they're going to probably go after all right. Well, before we get out of here, Mike, was there any story that you reacted strongly to today? A favorite one that made your eyes roll straight to the back of your head? Just what stood out to you today? I mean, I think it goes back to the the uh, the banning of generative AI uh, article. And and really, for me, that that's that's probably organizations want to go. Right. I think they want to. I'm not saying, look, embrace this and tell your people just to use it however they want. Put in good awareness, put in good controls monitoring, knowing who's doing what with, with those solutions. And maybe you don't want those solutions available in certain parts of your network or environments, and that's fine, right? But I'm not a fan of bands of when it comes to innovation. We have to balance cyber risk with business needs. And I think all, Alan Arford said this at, a, at, a, at the podcast that I had done uh, with him back in May. It was, hey, you know, in the, in the cyber, really the driver for the business, right? We're trying to be there to, to, to keep the business going, be res, uh, have a resilient organization so that, that a cyber attack doesn't shut us down or a compliance issue doesn't shut us down. And, and we don't want to stand in the way of innovation. We want to be along that ride with innovation because that's the only way we're going to be able to secure that stuff, right? Yeah, there is a business risk in not following innovation, right, too, as opposed to just the risk of the technology itself. So uh, definitely uh, uh, words of wisdom. And I, I can't wait to see as this, uh, you know, as we see AI evolve and, and the conversations that come out of it. So thank you so yep. much, Mike Woods, the corporate CISO for thank GE. You. Truly appreciate your time. Uh, where can people find you online uh, if they are so inclined? Uh, LinkedIn. Uh, uh, my LinkedIn uh, is, is Woods MI. Is the, the search for that. You'll find me. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And we also will have a link to your 2023 Director's Handbook on Cyber Risk Oversight in the show notes, so make sure you check that out as well. Thanks also to our sponsor, Conveyor. Pass your security questionnaires to their AI bot. Also, thanks to everyone that was watching live today. We appreciate that. If you are catching this later, remember, you can catch us every single Friday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, 12.30 Pacific. I did the math. You were worth it. Uh, we can't always get Get every comment we get up on the screen when we are doing this live show, but we want to see those comments and hear your thoughts as we're talking about this. If you've got any questions, we would love to address those on the show as well. Remember to join us next week for Super Cyber Friday, where our topic will be hacking conferences, an hour of critical thinking about shaking up the old format of in-person events. And we'll be back next week with another episode of the Week in Review Show. Can't wait for that. If 
you say, I can't wait for a whole week in review. I need news every single day. We have a solution for you. It's called Cybersecurity Headlines. Every single day, give us about six minutes and you'll be all caught up. Until the next time we meet, I'm Rich Straffolino reminding you to have a super sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.